Hello Year 8, it's Mr Sutton here and I'm going to just introduce you to the topic that we're going to be having a look at today and indeed how we're going to be looking at design and the environment and environmental factors in design um, over the course of the next few lessons while we're in our lockdown. Now I'm going to be going through this PowerPoint on here. There will be bits and pieces on Show My Homework which will link to A, this video, but B, to the resources that you need and I'll also talk about the task as well. So this will kind of be like a marriage together of all those bits. So hopefully you should be able to do all the work at home without any problems. Um, as I've just mentioned, we're going to be looking at design and the environment. Obviously, the environment is such an important part of everything we're, you know, in the world at the moment. It's a really on topic kind of um, subject to be looking at. And it's very, very relevant to design. And you'll see why. Today, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at renewable and non-renewable energy sources. Now, you probably have some idea about this already, and you may have done some of this within science as well. But we're going to be recapping about this and looking at how that can have an impact on how we design things for the future. So you should be able to understand what non-renewable and renewable energy sources are. You'll also understand why non-renewables are bad for the environment. You've probably got a bit of an idea already about why they're bad for the environment, but hopefully by the end of this, we'll build on that one. And we'll be able to explain the benefits and advantages stroke disadvantages of different energy sources. And hopefully you'll be able to think about those in a bit more detail than you have been able to before. Now, starting off with, I just want to really talk about um, the formation of non-renewables. Now, non-renewables are something, um, a resource, an energy resource, that we only have a certain amount of. That's why it's non-renewable. We can't make any more of these. Um, this, obviously, we can see here, this is a formation of coal that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. And this is a simple sort of infographic that explains how coal is actually made. You may not realise this, but coal is a kind of plant or wood. It started out, as you can see, just on the left-hand side here, as peat swamps millions of years ago and these trees just like they do at the moment they die down and they start to decay and through pressure and time so squishing down the layers of the earth formation over many many millions of years it goes from being peat and wood through lignite which is another form of between peat and coal to finally being this kind of coal at the end. Now, one of the reasons why this is often linked to something called CO2 carbon dioxide is that back millions of years ago, we had a lot more carbon dioxide in the world. And it was one of the reasons why the world was actually a lot warmer place. Now, you should know from science, or maybe you just know from your general knowledge, that plants take carbon dioxide out of the air and actually readmit the oxygen back into the air. So they take the carbon out of the air, and that's happening all the time. And there's a lot in the news about how we need to encourage um, different types of formations of rainforest, plants, and also um, plants on the seabed to try to lock away the carbon that we're spewing out into the atmosphere from the non-renewable fossil fuels that we are burning to allow us to keep our houses warm, to produce electricity and also for transport in the form of diesel and petrol. And in fact, this type of, we've got coal here, but if we think about as well, petroleum and natural gas, it's the same kind of thing. Whereas in the first one, it's trees, plants that are dying, falling to the floor, being fossilized, being squished down over millions of years to form coal. The same type of process happens with petroleum and natural gas that you have these creatures often sea animals because this is where the period where the, uh, the oceans were a lot larger on the planet that you had these sea creatures that were moving around and they died down their bodies fell to the floor of the ocean were covered over in silt uh, which is kind of like a soil at the bottom of the ocean and then over 50 to 100 million years the actual bodies of these animals decompose and under heat and pressure enormous heat and pressure they are turned into what we call uh, petroleum or crude oil and also natural gas now natural gas is the stuff that you probably have your home heated i know that i'm sat here i have the heating on because it's a horrible day today 
I'm using natural gas. That natural gas is actually formed by, by the decomposition of these millions of years ago, 300 to 400 millions ago, years ago, animals and their decomposition. And we're taking that carbon that was locked up. So they ate the plants. They were also locked away the carbon in their bodies. And we're then releasing this carbon that was locked up millions of years ago. So both of these, coal, petroleum, natural gas, they're all fossil fuels. And what they come under is what we call non-renewables. And you can see them on the left, uh, right hand side here in that we've got these fossil fuels which come from crude oil. So those are obviously the decomposing or decomposed bodies of millions and millions of year old sea creatures. Coal is going to be the um, breakdown or de squished, decomposed plants and trees from millions of years ago and natural gas, the same type of thing as the crude oil. We also have on here nuclear because nuclear energy, which is something which produces a lot of electricity in this country, comes from us using uranium. Now, uranium is an ore. Um, there is only so much of it. And by the process of fission, um, that means that that is actually changed. It is changed right at the atomic level. And therefore, once it has been changed, once the energy has been released from that nuclear plutonium and uranium, we cannot actually then reuse it. So it is a non-renewable. So none of these are being made anymore. Millions of years ago, they were started their creation. It's taken millions of years to get to the point where they are usable by us. We're just not going to be able to have any. Once they're gone, they're gone. The difference is the move we're moving towards renewable energy. Now, renewable energy by its name means that it is renewable. It is constant. It is always there. It is not going to be depleted. And there's some really quite straightforward and simple ones. Now, solar energy is something or photovoltaic, which means that it's a type of substance where the sunlight falls onto the surface of these photovoltaics and it is turned into voltage, it's turned into electricity. So those are solar panels and you will see those on houses. If you're lucky enough, you may even have some. Your calculator may have a photovoltaic cell on the front of it because they only use a tiny amount of electricity and often they will have something just on the front of it. So a solar panel can produce electricity and of course the sun isn't going anywhere. Um, it is a renewable energy source that constantly falls down onto our planet and we've got certainly millions of years left of the, the fusion or fission reaction, fusion reaction of the sun happening. We've got wind energy, which is also driven by the sun, but wind energy. So we've got wind turbines that you can see around. There's quite a few around me. Um, we've got quite a lot of them in the country. So again, that is something which is constantly there. It doesn't, it doesn't run out. It's going to be renewable. And we've also got biomass and hydro energy. Now, both of these ones are a bit interesting. Hydro energy, for example, and I'll just flip onto a web page just momentarily for this. We're talking about something like this, um, a dam. So if you're thinking about, if you go up to the Lake District, um, if you go up into Scotland and other places, you'll have rain that falls on the hills. That gives it gravitational energy. So the very fact that rain falls on the hill is then kept inside a, a reservoir and then is held back by a dam. It has got that kinetic energy, a lot of kinetic energy. So when that water is released and is actually allowed to flow into a lower position, then that can turn what we call a turbine. So you can see in here, you've got the reservoir, the intake, and you have this turbine, which is very similar to a wind turbine in that it is a blade that spins. And as that spins, it goes into a generator and that generates the electricity. So hydroelectric power, and we've got another diagram just here, hydroelectric power is very, very simply where you have water that has been held in a higher position behind a dam and it has kinetic energy. So it has the potential kinetic energy that is then released when it is allowed to fall to a lower level and runs through a turbine, spinning it and creating electricity. As simple as that. Now you have biomass. Now biomass, would you believe, is just decaying vegetable matter. Now we talked about fossil fuels. 
being that decayed matter, well, this is kind of similar to that. If you take something, um, anything, I mean, you know, you can take animal waste, you know, poo, we, you've got vegetable matter that we throw away, so scraps from your food, um, our own waste, and what happens is those are broken down by bacteria. Now, as the bacteria eat and break down and convert that biomass, that waste that we have, into something that they survive on, they can release another type of gas, very similar to natural gas. It's called methane. Now, for those of you that um, yeah, like some sort of those kind of sort of potty humor, when you fart, that has methane in it. It is flammable, and we can use that flammable gas again to heat water, which then turns and spins a turbine. So biomass is another form of renewable energy because, of course, the sun allows the plants to grow. The plants can then drop down, be turned into this gas, and we can use it again. Geothermal is a bit of an interesting one. Again, a little bit of a diagram is possibly necessary for geothermal. When we're talking about geothermal, that is where we actually take water, and you can see it in this diagram here, and we pump cold water down deep underground. Now, you're probably aware that at the centre of the Earth, there is magma, there is a core, there is a liquid core, literally liquid rock, and it's very, very hot. If you think of a volcano, you've got all that spewing matter of molten rock coming out. It's very, very hot because of the pressure, the gravitational pressure of the planet, the whole planet. So it keeps that mantle, that area of rock very, very warm. And we can use that energy. So what we can do is we can pump water down into the actual um, mantle, low down into ground. It's heated up and it comes back up again and it's warmed up and it's superheated. And in fact, you can think of it, you can get these geothermal energy in places like Iceland, for example, where they have a lot of geothermal because it comes to the surface. Then it's got very, very hot springs. You can use that A to heat homes directly, or you can use that steam again to spin turbines. And we're saying this a lot of the time, it's always spinning something. The only one that doesn't actually use a spinning something is the photovoltaics. Everything else, hydroelectric, biomass, geothermal, it is usually used to create steam by heating water that can then, like in a steam engine, push a turbine. So geothermal, the planet ain't going anywhere. The gravitational forces inside the planet are going to keep on going as long as we're spinning around in space. So it's not disappearing anywhere. It ends up being a renewable energy. So those are the two different types. And it's very straightforward and simple to think about those. Some people get a little bit confused about the nuclear element. But as long as you understand that at the moment, that is coming from a ore, uranium or plutonium in the ground. Therefore, it is non-renewable. And you can see here in this diagram, and I'll, obviously you can have this PowerPoint, some of the ways, and you can see biomass, solar energy, hydroelectric, hydrogen fuel cells is another thing using um, hydrogen itself, could be used in the future, geothermal, tidal is another one, we haven't actually mentioned about that one, but the motion of the tides, where the tide comes in and then moves away, water can be trapped and want to return to the sea and therefore can go again like the hydroelectric can be forced to go through a turbine and spin the turbine so generating electricity and vice versa when it's coming back in again and the wave energy that motion of things going up and down could be turned through mechanics into a force that can spin a turbine all of these produce renewable energy something that in this country and in the world we need to do to try to stop the ongoing effects that we have had over the many years of human and mankind using fossil fuels, the fact that we're heating up the planet and we're having that environmental change. These are some of them in a nice other list. So you've got non-renewables, coal, oil, gas, and of course you put in there nuclear as well, and the renewables, biomass, biodiesel. Biodiesel is where you take plants as, as rapeseed, and you take the oil that they produce, and that is actually placed into a normal kind of diesel engine that has been slightly tweaked, and that means that it can run just as we have like a normal diesel engine. Tidal, wind, solar, and hydroelectric, which we've already spoken about. Now, what I'd like you to do, we've got these individual tasks that I want you to have a look at. Now, I've obviously explained that in some detail. 
Well, I've got two individual videos and they're just here as video links. And I'd like you to watch them as well as this one. Now, you probably already, because this will be on YouTube, you will have already come to where I'm hosting it on YouTube and you will see that I actually have a YouTube channel, Mr. Sutton DT. So if you need to search for me on there, you can do. Don't worry, the links are already there. I have a number of playlists on my YouTube channel with loads of different videos that I've created and other ones that other people have created. And I have them in playlists to help you. Now, if you come down onto this one, we've got loads and loads of different ones. But one of the things we've got is underneath these ones, and we just find it as well, you will see the playlist that has got all these individual um, videos in. And you can use that and have a look at that to basically gather these ones up. And I will just find it. Because it's, there we go, sustainability. And you can see we've got loads of different things about design and sustainability. Now, the ones that I actually want you to have a look at because they explain about the sustainability and non-renewable energy sources is this one, which is non-renewable energy sources just there. And I've also got another one that talks at the bottom a little bit more graphically about renewable energy sources explained as well. Now, both of these, this one's 2 minutes and 39 seconds. And the one above, let me find it again, is 3 minutes. So we're talking about what? five and a half minutes, six minutes worth of video. So not a great deal. After you've done that, you can answer these questions. And I really suggest that you don't just try to rush through this and go, oh, Mr. Sutton's explained it. I'll just go ahead. Watch those videos because they are really good. And by all means, have a look at some of the others that I've got in there. We will be using more of those videos later on. And as I do this series of work over the next few weeks, I will be using a lot of these videos on YouTube. So you'll get used to this. Um, the first question, explain two reasons why coal is classed as a non-renewable energy source. Hopefully you can almost answer that instantly. Two, explain one reason why solar cells are more environmentally friendly than rechargeable batteries. Now, I haven't spoken about rechargeable batteries, um, but they are they're a controversial thing. I want to see if you can answer that one by watching those videos and seeing if you can do a bit of research. I'll be interested to see what your answers are on that. Explain the advantages and disadvantages of using wind systems for generating electricity in remote countryside. You think about it, we do have wind turbines. Some people like them, some people don't like them. Again, you might have to use your skills with Google. You can watch the videos as well. They will help you out, but it's testing your ability to use common knowledge and your researching skills there. Describe the environmental disadvantages of using oil as an energy source. That should be nice and straightforward and simple because I've already spoken about that. And finally, for number five, explain two reasons for using solar power instead of coal-powered power stations. Again, those should be easy and straightforward. So I'm thinking that the second and third questions are going to be a bit more challenging. The first, fourth and fifth should be really straightforward and you get those from the actual videos I put up. And if you're interested in it, there's an extension task as well. We're always looking for our shout outs and for those people who get those achievement points. Justify why we still use fossil fuels when evidence suggests the renewable energy sources are better for the environment. Because we still do. If you look at it, we still have to use, I'm still using gas, you're still using gas in our homes to actually heat. Um, we could use electricity. Why don't we? Um, there are other ways. We could actually have ground pumps. We could use geothermal. Why don't we? What are the reasons for it? Bit of a Googling. Bit of, maybe you already know. Maybe your parents know. But have a look in there. BBC Bite Size might help you. But I want you to really try to extend your understanding of the environmental issues around energy. So that's all those. As I said, have a look at those videos. Hopefully you will enjoy those. Uh, the next lesson we're going to have a look at, we're going to look at a bit more on plastics and different types of plastics, and I'll be doing another video introducing those. But thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to seeing how you've managed to react to those. And hopefully you're keeping yourself safe and everybody around you. Take care, year eight, and speak to you soon.